Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our webinar all about hummingbirds. We are so excited to have you join us to learn more about hummingbirds from Diane Checklet. My name is Sarah Halson and I am the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon. We're an organization dedicated to fostering the appreciation and conservation of birds and the environment that we share. We could not do the work we do without our funders and members. So I wanted to be sure to thank those of you who are members and supporting projects like these. Some quick Zoom housekeeping before we begin today. You are able to control your video and your microphone in the bottom left of your screen. So we ask that you keep yourself muted so that we do not receive feedback from your microphones. You can also see a closed captioning today I, I have to click, I forgot to put that on, but I will add that by clicking on the live transcript on the bottom of your screen. You can open the chat box by clicking on the chat button on the bottom of your screen, and we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, just add them to the chat and we will hopefully get to them all. We are also recording the webinar today and it will be shared via email in the next week or two, and you'll also be able to find it on our YouTube channel. If you have any further questions at all, please reach out to me and I will do my best to assist you. Diane Checklich is a film producer who lives in Detroit. She also enjoys birding with Detroit Audubon and regularly, regularly goes bird watching on Belle Isle and other places in Detroit. An ardent environmentalist, she believes it's critical to protect flyways and habitat and is active in promoting solar energy in the Detroit area. Thank you and welcome Diane. Oh, well, hi everyone. My name is Diane Checklich, and I'm on the board of Detroit Audubon and I am a big fan of hummingbirds. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join the presentation tonight. I hope you really enjoy it. I've had fun putting it together and um, let's go ahead and get started. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, all right, great. Yes. So um, Sir David Attenborough, the famous British broadcaster calls hummingbirds, the stars of the birds. I couldn't agree more. Um, and tonight we'll learn some of the reasons why. We'll talk about different kinds of hummingbirds and where they're from. We'll talk about physical features of hummingbirds. We will talk about how hummingbirds have inspired us and found their way into human culture. And we'll talk about how to support hummingbirds in our local yards and green spaces. And finally, we'll talk about how to share our own hummingbird sightings with um, scientific research. So there are all kinds of hummingbirds in the world, specifically um, over 300 species around the world. And when I say around the world, I mean the Americas. Their hummingbirds are strictly found in the uh, Western hemisphere. And from smallest to biggest, we have the bee hummingbird, which is only two and a quarter inches long. And that's found in Cuba. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have the aptly named giant hummingbird, which is nine inches long. And those are found in the Andes mountains area in um, South America. And actually about half of all hummingbirds are found in the Andes area. So that's really the, the hotspot for hummingbirds around the world. So moving up to uh, Central America, Let's see here. In places like Panama, which I visited a couple years ago with my friend Barbara from Germany, who is on the, on the call tonight. So thanks for joining Barbara. Um, they have about 60 different species of hummingbirds in Central America and in Panama. Um, these are some photos that I took. This is a violet headed hummingbird. It's kind of like a little flip book with these two photos next to each other. This is a photo of the bird with its mouth closed. And here you can see its tongue sticking out. Hummingbirds have long slender tongues that fit inside their long slender beaks. 
And also in Panama, a very common hummingbird there is the rufous-tailed hummingbird. And here's a little, another little Diane flip book with the, um, the bird sp spreading its beautiful rufous tail for all the world to see. So had a lot of fun in, in Panama. It's a great place to go birding. Lots of very cool hummingbirds. So moving more north into North America, we have around 12 or 13 regular species of hummingbirds here in North America. And this map here shows their range. The ruby-throated hummingbird um, is the only hummingbird found in the eastern half of the United States. And here in Michigan, where I am, um, the ruby-throated is the only hummingbird you can find. So if we see a hummingbird, it's a ruby-throated. Uh, going more west, we have the black chin hummingbird, the Anna's hummingbird, and the rufous hummingbird. Those are the four main ones, and there are other hummingbirds in North America as well. And they are, um, here are some photos of what those hummingbirds look like. Here is our ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, this is a male with the, the red feathers on its throat, and this is a female feeding into this cardinal flower. Um, here's our map again, so you can see how common they are on the east side of the United States. Moving more west is the black chin hummingbird, and it can be found in Texas and up um, toward California. And the Anna's hummingbird are found all along the California coast. Very pretty head feathers on the male uh, Anna's hummingbird. And then finally, the rufous hummingbird is found more in the Northwest US and up into Canada. And all these hummingbirds are moving north right now as we speak, uh, migrating into the United States. This is an up to the date April 15th map that shows where hummingbirds are as they're migrating up to the US. These red are the uh, sightings for the uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird. So you can see they're all over in the Kentucky and Tennessee area right now. And a few are starting to trickle into Michigan. And several of the other kinds of hummingbirds are also moving as well, but you can see that uh, the vast majority on this map are the ruby-throated hummingbirds. Uh, so, We're going to talk a little bit about some of the physical features of hummingbirds. There are really some amazing um, characteristics that these birds have, and we'll, we'll look at a few of them individually. Not the least of which is their shimmering, vividly colored throats. And those feathers on their throats are called gorgets. And uh, gorgets are uh, used for attracting mates. They're typically on the males, although a few, few females also have gorgets, but they're used for attracting mates and also for um, defending their territories. And those colors, interestingly, don't come from pigments in the feathers. They actually come from little microscopic air bubbles that reflect the light and create the, um, create the color impression. So it's not from pigment, it's from light reflection. So um, really spectacular colors in these gorgets. Um, hummingbirds also have teeny tiny feet. They really can't walk. They only use their feet for perching and um, uh, they, they actually perch about 80% of the time they fly the rest of the time, but their feet are very tiny and you will not see them walking around. <clears throat> They weigh about as much as a penny, so very lightweight little birds. And their wings beat 80 times a second. Uh, so if you think about that, that is a, a lot of uh, wing beats. They, they move forward and backward and they, they create power on both their forward stroke and the back stroke. And they're the only birds that can actually hover uh, in the air and they burn up a lot of energy beating their wings that fast. They have the highest metabolism of any creature and they actually need to feed every 15 minutes. And their food consists of uh, nectar, 
and flowers and uh, insects for, for protein. You can see here hummingbird feeding in a long tubular, tubular flower. Their beaks are really well designed for getting into tubular flowers, right? And they also pollinate flowers. Um, the pollen gets on their beaks and heads, and then they move to the next flower to feed as well, and they end up pollinating them as well. And so hummingbirds are, are important pollinators. There are certain flowers that they, that they are the only ones who pollinate, and their beaks have evolved um, to be able to do that task in a very specialized way. This hummingbird right here is a sword-billed hummingbird, and its bill is actually longer than the hummingbird's body. And this hummingbird specifically evolved to pollinate this flower here, which is a six inch long um, flower that is only pollinated by hummingbirds. Similarly down here is a sickle-billed hummingbird with a curved bill and its bill goes down into and pollinates curved flowers. So really some amazing engineering in nature uh, with the way some of these hummingbirds physiology have evolved. Now, since they need to eat every 15 minutes, you would think, well, how can they sleep at night uh, if they have to eat every 15 minutes? Well, uh, hummingbirds actually go into a um, kind of a hibernation state when they sleep. It's called torpor. And they slow all their bodily functions way down. Their heart rate is typically 400 beats uh, a minute when they're perching. They ratchet that down to 40 beats per minute when they sleep. And they consume about a hundredth of the energy that they would typically use when they're flying while they're sleeping. So they're able to, to uh, dial down all these bodily functions and they can, that's the way that they can sleep through the night without having to wake up and eat every 15 minutes. Now, the bad side of this is that um, they are they are, their body is dialed down so much that they can't even move when they're in this state. So they're very vulnerable to predators. Their nests, um, they're tiny birds and so they have tiny eggs. Their nests are only two inches across, and they're made of uh, soft materials like dandelion down and spider silk. Um, and they lay eggs, uh, they lay one to three eggs, and um, the eggs are about the size of a Tic Tac. Uh, and um, They can, they can lay uh, up to three clutches of eggs throughout the course of a year. Now, this photo right here was taken from a, um, a live hummingbird cam back in February. This was on February 6th. Um, and I also want to mention that you, you notice that this nest is in a um, string of Christmas lights. So they like, they like to set up their nests on narrow um, branches or obviously in this case, uh, Christmas lights. So these eggs were, um, were in the nest on February 6th of 2021. And two weeks later, they have hatched and these are the babies that are growing in the nest. Uh, a week after that, you can see that they're grown to the point where they're almost spilling out of the nest. Uh, the mother is feeding them here. And then um, they, these two fledged or flew out of the nest on March 4th and 5th. So 10 days later, the same female came back and laid more eggs. And so this live cam is still going on. And I'm going to play a little bit of that for you right now. Oh, you just saw a baby poop. <laughs> so, um, so those are the current set of, of babies that are in the nest. And uh, this live cam is sponsored by a YouTuber called Hummingbird Spot. And it's a, um, 
a woman who is a hardcore hummingbird fan and one of her pledges is to take a photograph of every single hummingbird species that there is in the world. If you remember there are 300 of those so she has her work cut out but um, she's a big hummingbird fan and she's able to share this um, this experience with anyone around the world who wants to tune into her live cam. This happens to be in California. So uh, you can see that it's 4.15 in the afternoon there. So this, the Hummingbird Spot YouTuber also has, um, oops. She has another live cam that I like to call the Hummingbird Cafe. It has all these feeders set up uh, and it's not super busy right now, must be in between um, uh, hours for them, but lots of hummingbirds come and hang out. These are, this is again in California, I think it's in Studio City, California. And you can see she also has little perches, these little trapeze kinds of things for the hummingbirds. And down here, there's some nesting material. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for hummingbirds who want to um, stop by and get some food, have a sit and get some materials for their nest. So again, you can have the, in fact, I have the, these on my computer uh, pretty regularly just to check in and see how all the birds are doing. It's kind of a fun thing to watch. So there are uh, literally hundreds of videos on YouTube about hummingbirds. Uh, one of my favorites is called Hummingbird Pool Party Number Five. And so hummingbirds don't really use traditional bird bath because they're too deep for them. They're, if you remember how small they are, and so they do like bird baths like this, which is basically a flat surface with water over the top of it. There are over 30 hummingbirds here, and you can see how much fun that they're having. They're just buzzing around and having a good time. So, uh, this particular video has had over 12 million views, so it's pretty popular. Like I said, it's one of my one of my favorite ones. So people are really enjoying hummingbirds, and um, that's a good segue into our discussion about hummingbirds in human culture. Um, hummingbirds have inspired humans not only to make fun videos, but um, in many other ways as well. The Dixie hummingbirds a well-known gospel group from the 1920s, uh, took the name, took hummingbirds into their name. Um, hummingbirds are all over social media. There's a whole bird Twitter community on Twitter. And uh, during the lockdown last year, I discovered a whole bunch of really great photographers on Twitter. There are three of, three of them here. And every day is like a, like a brand new photo gallery uh, for super cool birds, including um, hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are finding their way into um, things like real estate names and even faucet design. And the United States has uh, at least 14 different hummingbird festivals around the country, and uh, many of which are actual tourist destinations. People go to these on vacation, uh, including a big one in Rockport, Texas, which is where hummingbirds stop and um, bulk up before they migrate south across the Gulf of Mexico in the fall to uh, Central and South America. And uh, some of the hardcore festival goers have designed these things called Hummer helmets, where you can have a hummingbird feeder hanging from your own head and have a true up close and personal uh, experience with hummingbirds. So hummingbirds clearly bring us a lot of joy. Um, so what can we do to help them? 
Well, the best way to support hummingbirds is to create habitat for them. Um, birds in general are in decline all around the world and the major cause for that is loss of habitat. So if we can restore habitat for them, that is a huge help. So hummingbirds, in case you couldn't notice from the, some of the photos I've shown, they really are attracted to uh, red, red flowers, red feeders. And these are a few of the native plants here in Michigan um, that support hummingbirds. So if you're planting a garden and you wanna be able to support hummingbirds, consider uh, adding some of these. I actually have some red columbine in my balcony garden that I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Uh, in addition to the food that flowers can support them with, um, water is a nice feature to add. You saw how, that, how they were attracted to that in the hummingbird pool party. Um, nesting sites with the <laughs> Christmas lights or uh, slim branches where they can nest, um, perches, any of those kinds of features will help enhance a hummingbird habitat. Oops. And it doesn't have to be a huge habitat either. Even a little patch of habitat works. This is my balcony here in Detroit, and I have some container plants and a uh, hummingbird feeder, and they find it. This is a little Detroit hummingbird that came to my feeder, and I've had them pretty regularly uh, over the past few years. So I'm thrilled with that. I'm very happy, and they bring me joy every time I see them. So um, during the lockdown last summer, I decided to set up a motion-activated trail camera on my balcony to get some footage of the hummingbirds that came to visit me. And you can see in this photo, here's my trail cam. And um, here's a little hummingbird that was posing for my camera. So, um, so I was quite successful with that. And I'm gonna share with you some sample videos uh, from my trail cam this past summer. This is a male uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. If you look closely, you can see his throat feathers. They look black a lot of the time, but sometimes you see little flashes of that, of that red gorget. Um, this is a, frankly, this is the first time I've seen a male hummingbird at my feeder. I usually see females, not to say that he hasn't been there before, but this is the first time I've, that I've seen him and I was happy to capture that on my trail cam. And I repositioned the camera and here is some footage of a female ruby-throated hummingbird. So you can see it's coming right up near to the building. There's city sounds all around, but they're adapting and they can do their thing. She's just hanging out there having a snack. We'll have a little itch there. She's scratching her itch. So I saw these pretty regularly uh, throughout the summer last year and they really bring me joy. I really, really enjoyed that. Now sometimes non-hummingbirds show up to the feeder. This is a female Baltimore Oriole who showed up to my hummingbird feeder last summer. I was surprised to see her. I think she was interested in getting some of that sugar water, but um, I don't know how successful she was. So, um, the feeders themselves are look like this. This is similar to the feeder that I have on my balcony. You saw the other more vertical feeders in the, um, in the Hummingbird Cafe video. They're all kinds of shapes and sizes of hummingbird feeders. And um, I think Sarah was gonna put in the chat a link to a local Wild Burns Unlimited um, where you can get a hummingbird feeder, but they're not super expensive. They're easy to put out on a branch or on a hook. And um, 
as I have demonstrated with my hummingbird project, I mean, with my balcony project, they will find them. So the, the sugar water that goes in the feeders is uh, kind of simulates the nectar that they find in flowers. And the recipe is very easy. It's one part white sugar and four parts water. Uh, it helps to boil that water first so that the sugar dissolves in there. Um, some tips to make a good recipe are don't use organic sugar. You would think you could use organic, but there are minerals in organic sugar that might be good for us, but they're not good for hummingbirds. So stick to the regular refined sugar for that. Do not use dyes, some store-bought um, nectars have, have dyes in them and those are not good for the birds either. You don't need the food to be red. The feeder is already red. The flowers are red. So stay away from dyes and you can make a larger batch and the extra can be stored in the fridge uh, for up to two weeks. Um, uh, an important thing if you're going to put out a hummingbird feeder is to frequently change it, change that water to keep it fresh. Um, uh, if, especially on hot days, the, uh, the water can go bad, the sugar water can go bad. And so like when it, in the heat of the summer, it's important to change it every day or every other day. And also it's good to clean the feeder um, when you do change out the nectar. Um, so in general, the, the, the point here is to be responsible um, when setting up some support for hummingbirds. Keep the nectar fresh. If you have cats, it's important to keep them indoors. Cats kill up to 2.4 billion birds a year. So um, please keep your cats indoors. It's actually better for the cats as well. Don't put pesticides in your garden. Keep that as natural and organic as possible. Um, it also helps to turn lights off at night in your house or any buildings that you might manage. Um, when birds fly at night, they migrate a lot at night and uh, building lights disorient them and throw off their navigation and they can actually get caught up in lights and um, uh, exhausted from all of that. And finally, treat any windows that you have um, to avoid reflections. I, I think everyone's experienced the bird like bonking into a window. Well, that's actually a, a very violent event for the bird and can kill them. Um, this is a, a picture of a, of a hummingbird that tried to fly into that window. You see it, it looks like a nice clean reflection with trees and sky and birds think that's trees and sky. And um, so building collisions kill a billion birds a year and uh, anything we can do to prevent that and break up those reflections for them uh, will prevent those deaths. It's a completely avoidable situation. So there are different ways you can do that. You've probably seen like the bird stickers that you can put on the windows. Um, those are effective if you put them close enough together. Hummingbirds need um, um, those reflections to be broken up every two inches. Otherwise they're gonna try and fly through. Remember how small they are so they can fly through very small spaces. So uh, this, these are my windows and um, I drew, just drew lines on my windows with liquid, liquid chalk markers to break up those reflections uh, so that the hummingbirds who come to my balcony um, will be safe. So you can do this too. These markers are $10 at uh, Amazon. There are also um, other kinds of treatments that you can put on your windows to avoid collisions. Um, and the colors that work best if you want to do the marker thing are orange, white, yellow, and red. So the point of all this, if you're going to invite hummingbirds over, please do everything you can to keep them safe. Um, so while we're enjoying hummingbirds, we can also share our observations uh, and support scientific research. Audubon has an app called Hummingbirds at Home that, um, that is easy to use and it's a way for you to record specifically hummingbird observations and 
those observations go into a database that is used for uh, scientific research. And you can include things like where you've seen the bird, when you saw it, what kind of hummingbird it was, and if you saw it on a flower or a feeder. So this is what the Hummingbirds at Home app looks like um, from Audubon. It is, oops, uh, it's free and relatively easy to use. I've been using it for a few years and I passed my 300 sightings milestone last, um, last summer. And so it's a way for you to kind of keep track of what you see. And like I said, that the data that you record goes into um, a research database that's used by Detroit Audubon. And these are my sightings on a regional map. Um, you can see here in the Detroit area, there are 320 um, sightings, probably 300 of those were mine. So if any of you are in the Detroit area, please download the app and come and keep me company. Um, but it's a way to, to add value, um, add some scientific value to the, the hummingbird watching that you're already doing. And like I said before, the app is free um, from, uh, for Apple devices, iPhone or iPad. <clears throat> um, if you have an Android or you wanna record other bird sightings, which is also great, there's a kind of an, actually an industry standard app called eBird. And you can download that as well. That's managed by the Cornell uh, Lab of Orth Ornithology in New York, uh, which is a highly respected uh, bird research organization. So now it's time for a Zoom poll um, to get some feedback from you on the material that we discussed tonight. Sarah? Okay, well, thank you all for participating. Looks like, um, oh, do you have to share that, Sarah, when you're done? There we go. Okay, so thank you all for participating. Looks like 81% um, <clears throat> of the people are inspired to plant hummingbird-friendly plants. Um, about half getting a, a hummingbird feeder. It looks like I'll get some more company with the Hummingbirds at Home app and 63% um, are gonna make their homes safer for hummingbirds. Thank you very much. That last one's really critical. It breaks my heart every time I hear about a bird dying from a building collision. So um, appreciate everyone um, being inspired for all of those three things, all those four things. And uh, I will, Leave you with a um, final image of a mighty hummingbird doing its best impression of a mighty osprey, a little five inch wingspan compared to a five foot wingspan. Um, but I really enjoyed speaking with you this evening and um, uh, appreciate your time and attention. I hope it was worthwhile for you. Um, with Detroit Audubon. If you're not a member, please consider joining our organization. It helps us continue programming like this. So